future building of LEAF Academy. Um, we are really, really glad to host together with Pontis these uh, great uh, guys. So, uh, Lars, Lado, and Ivan. Uh, Ivan will be taking care about moderating, so he will introduce uh, the speakers a little bit more. And we want this to be as interactive as possible. Uh, usually this breakfast happens uh, internally in LEAF, we call it like LEAF X or inspirational breakfast. But this time because we had so uh, great guests, uh, we decided that we will open it up uh, for, for uh, our friends and friends of Pontis, which we are really, really glad for. And it's, uh, we will be spending together an hour and a half around 10 we will finish and maybe we can talk a little bit more uh, non-formally but we will see how it goes and, and how we feel. So welcome, welcome to leave. Welcome, good morning. Uh, does everybody have breakfast? <laughs> have coffee, some tea, some, some water? So this event is called breakfast, uh, international working breakfast with Lars and, and Lado. Uh, my name is Ivan. I'm from the Sharing Breakfast Foundation. We facilitate dialogues of students from European countries. And, and today we are here to talk about the role of the teacher, uh, the world teacher in the 21st century with, with Lars, uh, who is the founder of the Communicative Pedagogy and Ethnophil Culture and owner of the Adventure School in Sweden. And, and Vlado, who is, who is uh, the owner of Instant Testing, and also chief in editor of the Lash Good School. Um, yes, teachers, uh, Lars used to be a teacher and still is a teacher, Vlado also used to be a teacher, so I suppose what they have in common is they are experts in, in the field of education and they are change agents, whether it's Sweden, Denmark, or Slovakia. Uh, the plan for today, as, as Bubu has mentioned, um, Lars and Vlado will have uh, some speeches. Uh, we will have a panel discussion. Uh, yes, any, anything, anything which, which was not go, go, go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this has such an informal space, and we uh, know, know each other. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so, panel so discussion, there will be a time for you to, to ask questions, and also the, the last half an hour will be the, the workshop. So, we'll be here and we'll be speak here. Uh, you will have a chance to implement into to your practice, teaching and education practice. So, um, all right. So, um, would you like to start first about the role of the teacher and, and what you think uh, the teacher in the 21st century should have in their toolkit? Yeah. Uh, can you say the other agents? I'm checking. Yeah. Um, but what I've learned in my life is that um, the leadership determined the social world that is created around the region. It looks like we they want to talk about that. Too. So I, I call that the interaction of the people that there is, for example, in this room right now. For me, this is a social world. We're creating a social world. Something is happening in here, and this has an impact on us. And somehow it determines us for the moment and maybe for the future. And, and my experience is that leadership always has that impact. They determine the way that the roles are forming in the groups and the way we interact and what we do and how how we develop the, the, the language and what, what how we think, you know, how we do. This is determined by the leadership. And this is what I call for the social world. And this means that every group of people is a social world. And, um, and in the tradition, um, the tradition is like we're sitting today. You are spectators and we are the actors. And, and, and as long as you are sitting still and not interrupting me, not saying things when you are not ought to say something, um, I don't have to be your leader because there are no leadership. Because there are no actions, nothing is happening. You're just sitting there as spectators. But we still create a, a, a social world there. That social world actually makes you as victims. 
because you learn to think like a victim. Because you don't have the knowledge. You can't determine the knowledge. If you try to change it, you won't have the right path. So you have to reproduce what I give you. Because what I give you is already perfect. And you just have to give me the perfect back again. That's the history. That's the world that we live in. So, do we want to change that? Does it help if we, if we make new curriculums? I came to Sweden in 94 because they, they made a new curriculum, which I, I think is... I've never seen anything so fantastic as that curriculum they made in 94. But did it change the schools? No, it didn't. Why? Because the teachers did not study. But the curriculum doesn't determine the schools, the teachers do. So, therefore, I, I believe, you know, that, that we cannot change the schools if we don't change the teachers. Because they are the, they are the middle point of the social world. Have, have, I, have I felt this on my own body? Yes, I felt it on my own body. I felt that, that it's, it's so deep-rooted in my body to think in this dictator way. That I, I also am very relaxed here. It just feels right in my body that you sit there listening to me and I'm talking. It feels right. It feels like now there's really happening a learning process in here. It's still in me. It's so easy to fall back on that because it's in my body. And it, it can be so diff difficult to think different. Especially because we go into rooms, they look exactly the same. They look exactly as they did when I was a child. There's the blackboard, there you can sit, there they sit, you know, same thing. So, that, that I, I was uh, actually together with Ivan, I invited Ivan to, to visit the, uh, a guy in New, Newcastle here, here, I think it was in Bengal, we were up there, and, then I, and I, I found that really interesting. Sugata Mitra is his name, he come from India. And he, he actually showed that he could make better results in a class without a teacher than a bad teacher could make being. I think that's really interesting. So that's telling something, you know, that the worst teacher is actually worse than no teacher. <laughs> because the, the children are still victims and spectators, and they don't learn anything because the teacher can't teach. But if they are alone, they have to act. They understand they have to do something, which means they come out of the, the victim's mindset. That, that was the first question. <laughs> and the second question was um, what the teacher should have in their cookie. Yeah, actually first you said how, first it was how it looked like, you know, because I made a vision of it. That's also the, that, that was the first part. And then, then what two was the thing. Mm -hmm. Because I because of course the logical thing for me, that's why I said what I just said is that I want to turn this around. I I, I don't want the pupil to be the spectator. If I was in this uh, conference yesterday, I actually still don't know really what I was participating in yesterday, but it was a business conference, uh, it was a lot of innovative people, and it was uh, interesting to listen to, but I still do not exactly know what I was part of, but it was very interesting. And, but but, but when, when I, when I wrote up some things, you know, that, that, that for me would be very important, because you can say, if we take children out of that spectator's role, then teachers has to learn to be managers. They do not have to be managers as well. People sit still. If they don't do anything, you don't have to manage them. But at the same moment, they come out of these roles. I have to be a manager. And I was just writing down some things in the here in the morning. Um, the manager of active children, seeking, uh, asking questions, seeking knowledge, solving problems, working together, assessing themselves and each other, Using knowledge in a way that has impact on other people. This needs a manager. This needs a facilitator. This needs a completely different role. You know, I, I hear you. You know, we you can say we, we never had that system as you have there. You said I teach biology. We never wanted that in Denmark because of history and different things. Because 
if you, if you do this, then, then you can say, you, in a way, you also determine that you come in with a knowledge, and the knowledge is biology, and it's strictly limited to biology. It's difficult to make a life there, because life don't look like this. Okay, then the tools, sorry, 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 sorry. Then the tools. Uh, so, so, and what I was thinking about, okay, so what tools do you then need to be that manager? I was thinking about. And I was writing some things down there, you know. So, so for the first, uh, when I come out, the teachers don't know how to lead people. They never learned it. They live in an artificial world that is not like anything else, because nowhere else in the world you will get people sit there. <laughs> <laughs> and then you make you make the you make the, the, the system mandatory in many countries. So to, to think about it, what that would happen if you have a restaurant? Every day the same people come eat there because it's mandatory. They have to eat it, whatever you serve them. And your task is to make them happy. How is that possible? It's not possible. The equation doesn't fit. So we have to so we have to give people the teachers has to be managers and learn to be managers just like everybody else developing discourses uh, uh, just like we do today in modern companies and they have to learn to be facilitators they have to be self-aware a lot of teachers I meet for example they they do not know that they cannot stand because you know that what they do when they stand up they go to the head and get focused you, let me just show you because right now I I see two. I have placed the, the inner state in me. I have placed it somewhere between being relaxed and being focused. So, for many people, if you stand up, they do like this, you know. They go up to the head and they start to talk like this. Think if you were listening to me, how long time would you be able to listen to me before you get a little stressed, you know? To, to, to stand up here and, and stay in, in about this here, which I use there as much, it's very, very difficult. But teachers never learn it. They never learn anything how to modulate themselves in front of them, in front of people when they talk. Uh, so self awareness is for me uh, very important. And which is when I when I when I read the the, the results of, of the John Hattie, self assessment of the children is the most important. Uh, a child who is able to self assess can have a progress of four year in one year. So, so in the visible learning, which has, has you know sort of come out of his, teachers has to learn to give the children the knowledge. How do I assess your progress? All right. There's uh, another question. I have an additional question. Uh, what? Um, let's clean the space to the bottom. Okay. I have to change my glasses. <laughs> you had to do that when you speak, right? No. I do that when I read. I prepared a paper which I never do. I apologize for using it. It's not because of the English, it's because of the eight minutes, because I say twice as much. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to share some ideas with this wonderful audience. Uh, before coming to the role of the teachers, I'd like to say a few words about the school in general. It's more and more evident that the school is undergoing a deep crisis, not only in Slovakia, but in the entire Western world. Uh, let me briefly mention some of the factors which caused this crisis. Uh, I will mention five of them. Uh, it was the French philosopher Jean-François Lidotard who pointed out that our postmodern era is characterized by the dismissal of grand narratives. One of those dismissed narratives, uh, which started in the Enlightenment, was that knowledge and science will solve all our problems and that we will be totally happy. In the light of that belief, schools had been viewed as a respectable institute as, as respectable institutions preparing our bright future. But after the two world wars, people became aware also of the dark sides of mass education, which sometimes can serve as a tool of ideological manipulation, oppression and segregation. Ivan Illich, Paul Freire, and others wrote about that extensively. 
Another phenomenon typical of postmodernism is a general dismissal of authorities and of institutions based on formal authority. Church is a good example, and school is another one. The school has also lost its monopoly on knowledge and education. Nowadays, information and factual knowledge is available almost everywhere, and the internet offers plenty of opportunities for learning something without any school and any teachers. Four, we live in a world which fosters and adores individualism. People want everything customized to their needs and preferences, even the shoes and everything, watches. But the traditional school still represents a mass production industrial model reminding us of Henry Ford's car factories. And the fifth, last but not least, the authors of the school curriculum pretend to know what knowledge and skills will be needed 20 years from now. But that's hard to believe, and even the students do not buy it, and they refuse to learn what they consider not to be relevant to their lives. So all this, is, is, it comes as no surprise that all these problems have a negative impact on the status and on the role of teachers. One century ago, teachers were generally recognized authorities. They were part of a narrow elite, because there were many of them. They were better educated than most people around them. They possessed something precious, namely knowledge and intellectual skills that were available only within educational institutions. And they delivered something to the students that could profoundly change the lives and careers of them. Because 100 years ago, if you passed uh, an examination or you went to school for some years, that totally changed your opportunities that, and your life. You could become a clerk or a general or something, and that was a very big leap. Nowadays, teachers are not rare. We have 10,000 of them in Slovakia. Their, their, their education is no longer exceptional. Many parents have the same or even better education than the, than the teachers. What they possess isn't precious anymore because it's freely available from many sources. And what they offer to their students is no longer a guarantee of success. All this caused a dramatic decline of the social status of teachers, and we are discussing it all over again, that teacher is today not what, it, what he or she used to be many years ago. But despite all of these changes, the teacher still remains the most important single factor affecting the quality of school education. It's not the curriculum, not the textbooks, not the hardware or the software, it's the teacher. Unfortunately, those in charge of our educational system, I don't know how it's in Sweden, but I'm speaking about Slovakia, those in charge of our educational system do not understand this and they care much more about all the other things. In Slovakia, we do not select prospect teachers properly, we don't, we don't train, them, train them properly, we don't pay them sufficiently, we don't create suitable working conditions for them, we don't give them enough autonomy to do things as they want to do that or as they think uh, is, is the best way to do them, and we don't offer enough support to them. Instead, we put a heavy burden of bureaucracy on their shoulders which prevents them spending more time with the students. But the bad news is that even fixing all of the mentioned problems would no longer be enough. I think that if the schools want to regain its, their authority, the profession of the teacher has to be redefined in several important aspects. And I will mention just three of them. Uh, in the past, the task of the school was to teach, for example, the Archimedes principle. So the teacher, the main role of the teacher was to explain it to students and, and show how it can be used in everyday life or something like that. But today we face a different problem. Not only do the students not know the Archimedes principle, but many of them do not want to know it. That, that's a different problem. I believe that in the future, teachers will have to focus on motivation much more than before, and that they will have to look for new ways how to make the curriculum relevant to students and to pupils. Unfortunately, when I speak to Slovak teachers, I find that many of them do not consider motivation part of their job. They, they are expecting to find motivated students in the classroom, and if the students are not interested, they, they give up. The teachers give up. 
Another new focus of teachers' work will have to be, and that's what Lars mentioned, orientation, advising and guidance of the students. Management, you call it management. Mm -hmm. We live in a world of almost infinite possibilities to access information, but somewhat paradoxically, this abundance makes using it more difficult. Looking for something on the internet can be as difficult as drinking from a water hydrant or a fire hose. Too much, too much at one time. We assume that all our students, we call them digital natives, uh, are good at finding, selecting, sorting and critically examining information, but that's not the case. Many of them need to be trained at it. That, however, requires teachers which themselves are advanced users of modern technologies. Something we can only dream of in Slovakia. At the last thing, David Brooks, in his acclaimed book Social Animal, reminds us of a very important fact. In his words, the reality of education is that people learn from people they love. This is a psychological fact which must be taken into account when designing educational institutions. In our days, teachers must be able and willing to remove the formal gap between them and the, teacher and the students and establish more informal and even personal relationships. As John Maxwell put it very nicely, People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You probably know the most common, we probably know the most common typology of teachers, the pilotrops and logotrops. Uh, the logotrops are teachers who are focused on their field of study, on the content of the subject. And the pilotrops, on the other hand, are oriented towards students, their problems and interests. My prediction is that in the future, pilotrops will be more, su more successful and more needed than logotrops. More explanation, uh, mere explanation of the curricular content will have to be replaced by motivation, orientation, advising, providing of context and meaning, giving feedback, guidance and mentoring, maybe even coaching. The new teacher for the first 21st century will have to be an interesting person, a rich personality, somebody who is not narrow-minded but open to the world, who is intellectually curious, who loves asking questions and who keeps learning new things all the time. If we succeed to find and train enough teachers of that kind, there is a fair chance that the present crisis of the school will be overcome for the benefit of all the children and the society. If not, in the days of the traditional school, maybe counted. Thank you. <laughs> so I apologize for the paper. I was thinking about like whatever I ask now or say will be nothing or will uh, have no deeper point. But <clears throat> we are. <laughs> well, there's a reason why I'm moderator. Thanks very much. You know, so much. You're, you're talking uh, about the teachers, the facilitators, as coaches, as, as mentors, as, as guides, uh, as people who ask questions, motivate, stimulate. Uh, my question is the same question as I wanted to ask you, Lars, after your speech from the same thought from below. Why are we talking about the teacher? When we talk about the change of educational system, why the teacher? Of course, we, we can talk about funding and, and, and uh, bureaucracy administration, but why, why teacher? Why, why is the teacher so important? In a way, I already answered, but now I do it a different way. Um, uh, for me, I was talking about that yesterday, that the dilemma in development is that we cannot see ourselves. So, so think a little child born, and this child has to develop into something. And nobody knows. The child doesn't know, so I can't tell my parents, yeah, you know, some, some, somewhere deep inside me, there's, there's, a, there's a piano player, just let so you know. No, the child can't. The child can even not see oneself. Which means that, that I, I, I do not know what it is I should see 
that should trick my neuro, uh, my, my new neurons so that my, my brain start to develop. I do not know. So how do I know? Through other people. Which means that the people in center of me is the most important people because they are the persons that I knew myself from. In a group of people, the leader will always be that center. In the school system, especially the spectator school system, right now, who are the people in this room that you look at most? Us. And the schools at the point where we are right now is, is a spectator system. We spring the, the teacher. I've been into thousands and thousands and thousands of classrooms and I've seen it. Even in the best teacher's room, I've seen the pattern. They speak 50% of the time. Even more. Even more. So, so that's why. So, so in other words, uh, pupils or students see themselves through the teacher. Yeah. Most of the time, they do. And if the teacher is talking all the time, then they become paralyzed or disengaged. Or... They, they simply has to. They have to understand himself and that role. Because then they start, start start to get motivated. For example, that, that you can see it's fantastic that a person can lead people and not reflecting about the motivation of these people. That's fantastic. How is it possible? You see this, you know. So so everybody that everybody knows this. If you are a football coach, a football coach knows that if if I want my team to win, I have to work with motivation. If you go out in, 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 in modern um, uh, contexts, uh, business people know this. Why, why, how can how can I, you know ten of thousands of teachers not reflect on this because of the social world they live in? Therefore, we have to change their mindset, their point of view, their way of thinking, because much could be done without changing the system if they were changing. There's a problem when we speak about school that we don't say more specifically about what part of the school is because the school starts at the age of six and goes until 24 and the situation is different in the, in the various stages. So I think the role of the teacher is very important in the first stages in the grades one to six, seven, something like that, but we can't import the attitudes. And the attitudes are rooted in the culture, and we are not the Finns. The Finns have, the, or the Nordic countries have very low corruption. We have very high corruption. Go to Finland and find out what to do to have zero corruption. It's not possible to go and see and bring it, bring it to Slovakia, because we have, there are some reasons why we have the corruption, and I'm quite skeptical about this. I mean, I'm not saying we shouldn't go and see. It's very important to know that the school system must not necessarily look like the Slovak one. So it's very not, very important to go and see that it can look differently, but it doesn't mean that if we like something out there, we can bring it and implement it next week in our schools. I'm, I'm skeptical about that. What are you skeptical about your works? Well, I was thinking that this has something to do again with the spectator way of thinking. Uh, you can say that the spectator way of thinking is that knowledge comes only from the outside world. But if, 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 if you were thinking about what I said with this metaphor of the development, then it, that cannot be right because if, if, if nothing comes from the inside of me, it has nothing to do with me, it's not connected. So think about what, you, what, you really, what really motivates you. It's always something connected to you. It's not out there detached from you. So, so this means that, that in that way, uh, you're right. You cannot take something out there and just say it's mine because it's not. But what you could do is that you could say, okay, they are doing it. Uh, uh, how can we do something that will maybe lead us in that direction? What can we do? to start something on our own. 
we don't know where it ends. But in that way, we can get inspiration. Or we can only get inspiration for where we are. Um, I'm, I'm, as you said, from Denmark. And, and in my way of thinking, one of the persons that had had impact on that is Søren Kierkegaard. I don't know if you know Søren Kierkegaard, the philosopher, the extensive extent. And he, he wrote a letter to his, his dad, which is actually about exactly about what we're talking about. His dad was a very dominant figure. Then he wrote a letter to him, and, and in this letter, halfway, he says like this. So what I would like to tell you that is that no matter that it is important for you, it's not sure it's important for me. So to learn and help, you have to find people where they are and start there. If you don't do this, blah, blah. But this the same thing we talk about. You, you cannot start where you are not. You have to start where you are. So then the reason why the aliens are one of the most happy or the happiest nation in the world? Nobody can ask that, maybe we just live in some sort of illusion, I don't know. <laughs> but, 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 I, I, but it could have, it could, could have to do with it. That we don't have a mandatory school system. Um, that we always have nurtured the freedom and the individual freedom. Uh, that we are the nation in Europe that are moving most mostly around, about 30% change job in a year. Um, uh, we are the nation with the most startups in Europe, number three in the world. Yeah, there are some connections here. I don't know exactly what the answer is, but there's some connections here. Can I ask one more question? Then we will, we will give a space to you and your dilemmas and the challenges you face in your teaching experience. Uh, because part of the toolkit of the teacher is also uh, values and attitudes, which is also part of the system. In other words, uh, what kind of values we would like to implement in, in pupils through teacher. So, what values or what attitudes uh, should the teacher have in order to uh, transform them into, into pupils, students? I, I think in this respect, the situation of the teachers is nowadays worse than ever before. Because in the past, generally speaking, the, the civilization of, in our part of the world, of course, shared some values which were generally accepted. They were, there was no discussion about that. The teacher shared the same values and his role was to pass the values on to the students. But now we live in a world where the, we, we ourselves are not sure what our value values, and we see every day when we when we turn on TV or, or the internet that there are clashes among parts of the society which show that we do not anymore share the same values. And so the question for the teacher is which values are the right ones which I should pass on to the to the students. Our politicians don't, our, the leaders of the country don't share the same values as we see every day in the news. Uh, in Europe, different countries, I mean, I don't mean the, the very general values, but, but we have fights about almost everything now. So should the teacher say, refugees will come? Or should the teacher say, oh, refugees are a danger for Europe? Should the teacher say, what, what, what should the teacher say about the economy, about the Greek crisis, about Ukraine, about, about most of the same things. So today it's very difficult to distill those values which are so general and so, accept, so generally accepted that the teacher should be asked to pass them on to the... And also one big difference, before the, the parents didn't care about what the students do in the school or, or in, in, in much less way than today. Today it can easily happen that the teacher promotes some values and the next day the, the parent comes furious to the school and says that he does not want his child or to, to be confronted with this type of values. And you have 30 kids in the classroom, you have 30, 60 parents and they don't share many, many values. So it's, it's very difficult. I'm not saying that the teacher should not should resign and, and not to not try to promote some values, but but it should he, there should be some consensus about which values are those which uh, the parents 
are willing to to accept, which needs to come out from from a, a social consensus. Mm -hmm. Lars, when I one of the things that I've been doing and all my life is working with conflict, different different conflict people, and, and and actually this is what motivates me to make this call, but but. One of the things that I've seen that um, is a very, very important ability, that is the ability to, to listen to another person so that I don't mix my own mindset with the other person's mindset, so that I can separate you from me. For example, when I, when I, when I listen to Vladimir, I, 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 I try to listen this way. I, I, I sort of you know, nurture this in myself. And I can see that if we do this, that is when we become human. Because then I cannot judge you in my own head. So, see the, the refugee situation, this is what we do. We talk about refugees from our own interpretation. I saw a Danish politician, a, um, a right-wing politician, who um, sort of, he, he, had a, he was fed up with it. So he took a picture from Syria where a bomb had fallen and a father in despair is running out with his child and then he said under this on Facebook right now this guy is planning how to get the social welfare from them <laughs> you know because this is what he did and he got enough of it so we can't separate when I, when I for example sit and listen to you I hear a person who are able to build up sentences on a, on a, on a very high uh, leaks level. He used different difficult words like narratives and things like this. Uh, there's no way this, this he, he sounds like a scientist when he talks. But if you hear his message, he's, he's a very sensitive person with a lot of feeling and humanity. So I know this because I just listened to you. I have no judgment about it because if I did this, I couldn't hear what you said. And I believe that that is the most important skill that we can learn people to separate other from myself so that I can see them clearly and understand that just like me, they are humans. Different humans maybe, but humans. Alright, so... so features as, as human agents or agents of humanity. <clears throat> yeah, for me, this, this is actually a skill that is important and the spectator version doesn't do it. You know, students student can go in a class together and I say in my school, and if I go into my school, I say, if you're in the fifth grade and I go in there and I say, what are you doing right now? Okay. Who would be the best person in this classroom right now to help you? I want you to be able to say this. Because if you don't know this, you don't know enough about your fellow students. Right. Um, very interesting. Uh, you promised to let the main room out. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to find a way how to overbridge humanity with questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's human to let them ask questions. <laughs> <So> questions. <laughs> My name is Michael. I was just wondering, what would motivate you or a person like you to, uh, to be a teacher in a school uh, that actually teaches and motivates the students as you just described? Like, what is, what is the system or what is the, the surrounding, the, the ecosystem that motivates people like you to teach? I, I have again and again uh, felt it nearly religious when I meet people and I, I see them. When I really understand that I understand this person, I see the richness, the, the experiences, the, the thoughts, the mindset. I think that's fantastic. That will always motivate me. It, it, I've tried it in a bus, you know, sitting in a bus and listen to the bus driver, bus driver and say, wow, this is really fantastic. So, so being in a, in a place, in a platform where 
I can, I can meet people, understand people, understand that we are making impact with each other, that I'm going to meet this person 10 years after, and this person will tell me, do you remember that day? Yes, I do. Well, that was the day. That will always motivate me. But to hear myself speak day after day, no. <laughs> so it's like students, basically. Yeah, yeah, for me, because that's my personality, it's actually the meeting, the single meeting. And the students, for me, is something I've been provocative in, um, I, I, when I, when I, I, at the time I was traveling around and talked to a lot of teachers, under the, 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 I said, the pupils are also humans. So, for me, a pupil is just a human. It doesn't matter the age, it can be a baby, and I can say, well, fantastic meeting this baby. It's the meeting that motivates me. And the development in that meeting. Hi, my name is Lucia. We have uh, last student any experience with uh, reading with children to give feedback, active feedback to the teachers, because I think this is partial. This could be a solution to actually listen to children and provide information, either anonymous or or maybe just you know open feedback uh, to to teachers because they don't get it and kids actually are good observers and they can compare it, so. Yeah, we do that every day in, 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 in some of the schools that I work with also. I believe what you said was that pupils learn from people that they feel loved in. So to, to answer your questions, you have to put the love in first. I, I'm not using the word love, I use the, the word trust. So how, how do you create a trust environment? Um, how, do you, how do you give children a voice? That's a fantastic thing when, when the little introverted girl takes a voice and starts to talk because she trusts and that she, she gets the space to think so that she can think before she talk and now she starts to talk. If you do this, it's easy to be honest. If it's easy to be honest and we want the honesty, we can give each other feedback and we will understand that feedback is always very valuable. Just as that, when they talked about before, we started to talk to you. We need feedback and one feedback is of course the feedback of the teacher, which is the most important. So actually, what can we do now? Because now the, we, we don't have any the, um, guaranteed uh, uh, um, space of trust, really. You know, in, in many in many ways or situations, you know, the relationship is not uh, so open, and we cannot really rely on teachers that they won't take personally. So, do you think what we can do or start doing is anonymous feedback, like just collective, uh, I mean, individual but anonymous, and they would just receive it and really make you, you, you shouldn't ask me the question. Uh, you should ask Vlad the question because he has a good answer to it. So I just pass it on to you. Uh, uh, I can just say what's our experience with this of, with this idea of giving teachers feedback from students and, mm -hmm. and parents. Because our company exam, we have a, a project called Compile. It started only with testing, but then some years ago, late ago, we we added questionnaires. We offer schools if you want. We have questionnaires for teachers, students, and parents. Uh, they are anonymous. Uh, we send you the questionnaires. You the, you collect the answers. We make the results, and we discuss and we give you the results. We have 1,000 schools who are interested in the tests, and we have just 100 schools interested in the questionnaires. And one of the reason is that the schools are afraid of asking teachers, uh, of asking parents and students what they think of the school. Even if it's anonymous, it's, it's not, it's, they're afraid to learn something they, they maybe they don't want to know, or we often hear it's improper to ask small children age 9, 10, 11 years what they think of their teacher. It's the, how can they know they are small, they don't know anything about the world, how can they have an opinion about the teacher? He is an expert, he studied, he, he knows everything and this is a small child. So they simply 
don't are not interested in the feedback, and that's a big problem. Once they are interested, we can do a lot. Once they are not interested, but what can, what we can't can we help. What can we actually do to make them interested? Yeah. So we need more discussion, maybe you know, maybe conference. And they and they really sh would need the feedback because one thing we do, we have a set of questions which is identical in the teacher and student questionnaire. For example, we have a, a whole set of questions about. What does a typical lesson look like? How much time does the teacher stand in front of the classroom and explain something? And the same question is in the teacher and student questionnaire. The teachers say almost never, 20% of the time. And their students say almost all the time, 80% of the time. And, and this is the pattern with most of the questions. The teachers see the same situation totally different than the students. And to be honest, in this case, I trust more the students than the teachers. And, but, but from that I see that the teachers desperately need the feedback because they don't see the reality. So I would be very glad to offer some tools to get feedback from the teachers and the parents, but the problem is that the schools are not very interested. Some, some are, but most of them are not. Even if it's anonymous, even if it's just statistical data, they, it's opening the Pandora's box, okay, I mean... So it's, if you can say that, there are two ways here. Um, the way, one way is to say, but that's, that's how it is. You, have, you, have, you are living in a society uh, where somehow, because of the, the way you, you interpret each other and live with each other, you have developed suspiciousness. And, and it feels like listening to you that it is very strong. So therefore, you can do, you can say that you can think in the suspiciousness and say that because we are dangerous for each other, we can do it this way. And even if you do it this way, then it can be difficult. Or you can go the other way, that, that I would say that. I, I would say we start to, to, to talk about that we are not dangerous to each other. <coughs> People are not dangerous. It's not dangerous to talk to your wife, it's not dangerous to talk to your students, it's not dangerous. But you have to do it. So what will happen if you sit down and just, just ask the questions? Can you tell me some positive things about my, uh, uh, my way of a teacher, something that you would like me to do more of? Uh, I see the same pattern when I go into, to, for example, Sweden or Norway or whatever I do in Australia. And, and what I do when I go in, I go in with a little camera. And, um, and then I talk first with the teacher, what is actually that you want, what would you like, okay, this is what you want, and we know the curriculum too, and things like this. Then I go in with my little, my little, little camera, and I film, I go home, and I find the things that the teacher does, that is what he wants or she wants to do. And I only show this, because I show anything negative, they can only remember the negative thing, so I never show a teacher a negative thing. So that's what, what I would do. I would simply start to focus on the people that are not dangerous. Uh, you are good. Maybe you don't know it because you cannot see yourself, so you don't know you're good. But we can show you that you're good. Do you understand? So I can see there's only these two ways. Either you, you, you find a way into the suspiciousness, living with this, or you start to talk like we don't have to be. The feedback is one of the most important tools for the teacher. Uh, actually, will we have another idea for the next inspirational breakfast? Uh, good. I was just about to say, sorry, my name is Brian, I'm, I'm from Leaf. I'm sorry I don't see the colleague David here because when we talk about the feedback, one of the Leaf programs David is running is mentoring of the teachers. As part of that, uh, last year we came up with an idea of offering feedback to teachers. Mm -hmm. So the program starts with a self assessment at 360 degrees, some of you may know from the business environment. And what was interesting to see that uh, the, there is a hunger for feedback from the from the teachers. Yeah. So, but I do agree with large point that the development or the trust environment was an important prerequisite before launching the feedback uh, surveys and everything in order to get an acceptance of the teachers. So, I mean, the more details I'm sure we can share with because it's one of our programs. Yes. Just, just Actually, I'm thinking you said that it's, it's not so dangerous. Or it wasn't like it's, it's no danger, but maybe it's just a different a point how to set it that it's. Not that it's not dangerous, but it actually can give you a lot, you know, to, I mean, a lot of positive things. So you don't even have to mention the dangers because unless you mention it, everybody's gonna get scared. 
Sorry. No, it's, sorry, it's just the psychology of it. But uh, to me, I mean, I have two kids, and uh, yesterday my my daughter uh, said that they had uh, a different teacher on reading lesson, and she said they um, read uh, Anderson's the Girls with the Matches, and that the uh, teacher told them that uh, Anderson wrote it because uh, you should see and value what you have because not everyone has it. And my daughter said, our teacher would never uh, say, this to us, say this to us. And I felt very uh, sad about it because I know their teacher is not really a good teacher. And mm. so that's, this is what, sorry, what inspired me about giving feedback. Mm. I'm sorry, what, what would she say, the teacher? What the daughter said that you, her teacher wouldn't say what? No. That uh, my daughter's regular teacher of reading, le of reading, of reading lesson, she would never explain at least like giving her another information on. Okay, so he wrote the story to let you know that you should value what you have because there are many people who don't. You know, like this added value, this actually discussion, this message. So yeah. her teacher was very, mm -hmm. she was burned out. So. Uh, All right, uh, we can have like four hands. I saw so so four hands. Uh, you and then. You and you and you. <laughs> <laughs> and then probably other people. <laughs> so can, can we start with? We yeah, okay. Uh, Lars, you said we have to start where we are not. We have to start where we are. So I think the situations we are right, right now in, the most of this, the teachers, as we heard, uh, are unwilling to uh, to listen to pupils, are not motivating pupils. So what are the concrete for example, three steps you would apply from tomorrow uh, to motivate <laughs> teachers to motivate students. If we have to force them by curriculum, by some norms, or we can somehow motivate the generation that we have right now of teachers, mostly the older generation, if we can motivate them, or we have to wait for the new generation. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. It's beautiful. You can say that, that one of the things that we were talking about before is how important is the teaching. So, so if, we, if we could think that we could come in contact with specific teachers and their classrooms, that would give us some steps. But if we, if we, if we, if, if we can say that in, in, uh, in Bratislava, in, in, uh, in Slovakia, this money we will never be able to find. So we, we, will, we will never be able to find the ability to come into classrooms because the money is not there. Which means that we somehow have to find a system that is more on the outside of the classroom. Then it's other tools. And, and I would say that I think that the self-awareness is the first thing. Which means, I mean that, I actually, if you ask as a teacher, I could give you something as a teacher because that's because I talked to you as a teacher. And we talked already, already yesterday. That's the one scenario. But the other scenario is okay. How do we do, have impact on all? I actually think that the, 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 the only way to come in is a self awareness system that where we start to reflect. And I would go in through the headmaster. And somehow um, the, the, through the headmasters, try to get the leadership of the school to, to take decisions to do something in our school because we believe that would be a good thing for our school. And there, uh, a questionnaire could be a good good uh, way in and thinking about, okay, then what are the questions on that questionnaire? And that we not even give them a questionnaire, but we also give them a method to work with the questionnaire. This means that you say that here's the questionnaire and here's a little book about the method to work with the questionnaire in the school. And then through the headmasters, we give them these two things. And, and we try to motivate the headmaster to do this with the teachers. And will the teacher be motivated by these steps? Well, um, I, I, uh, I remember many years ago, I was, I was talking about that. Uh, the, the spectator system victimizes the teacher. They start to think and reflect. A lot of them will understand that they are called in the system. They, will, they also can start to understand that they also lose their motivation. How, how many years 
isn't motivated to, to, take, to tell the same about all of the things. If, if we, a lot of teachers, they end up that way. You know, they take the book, you know, and they, they start to do the same thing. So they are victims. I actually think that they would be motivated as well, some of them. I just like to end that there are two problems. One problem is that take the current teachers. There is a portion of them, I don't know how, I don't know how many person, maybe 20, who are really good, excellent, motivated teachers. We, don't, we want them to stay in the system, which, which is not an easy task because still many of them leave, but if they stay, we need to change the system so that they can do the, their work in the way I, I call it, in the way they want it. They, they need some freedom, some autonomy, and it would be very helpful if they could spread the know-how and the enthusiasm within the system. But that's a problem because the system doesn't like this type of teachers. Not the system, but like ma many many head head teachers don't, many directors don't don't like them. So one problem is that we have some good teachers and they cannot show how good they are, they cannot use it because the system is, is set up in a different way. And but we also can't wait, we can't say, okay, this is an old generation, they have to die out then and new young motivated teachers will come. It's not true because now we have a situation where those new young teachers coming into the system are worse than they ever were before. They, it's not true that excellent, young, enthusiastic people are coming into education. They are not coming because the everybody knows that the situation in, in the education system is so bad that the young, enthusiastic, fantastic people don't go to schools. They go, they start, they make startups and go abroad and, and do many other things. So we, we can't just wait that the young generation will be better because the good young generation is not going to schools. And, and, and those going to schools are very bad prepared because they, uh, they study that we have very bad pedagogical faculties and they, they come, they even come to the school um, brainwashed and, and with very strange views about education. And even if they are so, enthusiastic, uh, the system basically oppresses them. Yeah. But that's one of the problems that the, that the, that the schools of education promote this, this type of, this old fashioned type of just stand here and talk. And, and many of the students take it and they come to school and they, have 20, they are 28 and they do the same things as the old teachers after 50 years of teaching. The, the gentleman in the back. The, the yeah. my, my name is Miroso, I'm here from Lee. Uh, I like very much the idea of uh, spectator's culture. For me, it's euphemism for description of the society in Slovakia or in Europe as such. Lars, what do you think, what was crucial in changing, uh, in your opinion, how to change the spectator's culture in, let me say, cooperative uh, team of people in the classroom? Because I don't think basically that these are the problem only of the Slovakia or Slovakia. Or yeah, it's also I know France, uh, Germany, uh, Poland, uh, Hungary. So this uh, traditional school where, where teacher is the one. Uh, this is this is not only Slovak problem. And the second, so the first question: What was the crucial? How to change this culture, spectators' culture, in something more positive, maybe? And uh, if this desire to change this is uh, really well founded in order to have that idea that from this point A we will get to point B where the school systems will all change into this mm -hmm. or this is going only possible on certain islands or you will have islands where this new culture will be possible and from there something nice or positive can come or you think it is possible to change all school system everywhere in this way. Uh, it's too big, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know. So, so yeah, give us yeah, some, yeah. some uh, video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I can say that one of the things that changed this in uh, in Denmark and Sweden was the liberation of the monopoly of, of, of the school system. Mm -hmm. uh, so they were in Sweden, for example, they were simply facing a situation 
where there will be so many private schools that uh, you will sit that you will, you will sit back with a governmental school system where almost only the disabled and non-motivated children will be in. So you simply have to act, you have to do something. So, so that that would be one way to to school like leaf, you know. If 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 too many children start to go there, uh, that would put pressure on the whole system. And in the Scandinavian country, money follows the child. So you lose the child, you lose the money. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that, that would be one thing. That's, that's on a political level. You, know, you have to do something to put a uh, dynamic in it. Um, on, a, on a micro level, um, you have to understand that you cannot do it with a conference. Because you cannot change the spectator culture by making people spectators. That doesn't work. So, so, so what we did was that we we simply uh, we simply started to 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 have teachers into situation that was exactly what we wanted to do. So they tried with their own body to be part of this system. Um, and I actually think that's the, that there is no other way. Um, it's in the body of the, the teachers. They don't know. It doesn't help to speak to their, their mind because they, they might know it here, but they don't know in the body what they do when they stand in front of the children. And if you then have enough money, now I know you're in leaf, so you will be able to do it. So first, first you'll be able to create workshops where you actually have the teachers in these workshops, working with them in the workshop. After that, you go out to the classroom. You follow the classroom. You get the feedback in the classroom. But in the classroom, when they are managing the children. That's on the micro level the best way to do it. But that's very difficult because it costs too much money and you don't have that money. So that's why it's so difficult to answer. Can we have the last questions? Then uh, also to make sure we have also time for workshop. Uh, we have no time for workshop. So we talked a lot about the teachers, how their world has changed, their world has changed. What about the students? You have met a lot of the students. How has their world changed? What do they see? How do they perceive the situation? What do they tell you? If you put yourself um, in their shoes, what do they think of you? If you see the world like, like the social world where we have a different role, and then you, you try to see outside school, how, how, do, how do children live? And, and somehow, uh, a school should be a motor for what's going on outside. It shouldn't be a separate world for everything's all world. So, so if you start to think about it, you, you can see the answers. You know, both my father and mother have been to school three and a half years. Every second day, girls, every second day, boys, seven years, three and a half years. So already in my third years, none of my parents would help me with homework. None of them. Um, there were, we had only three books uh, because they, they had made a, tried to, to buy a, a encyclopedia, uh, but they, they, it ended up with Citroen. That was sort of the end of Citroen. Uh, you we know, never went beyond Citroen. So, uh, Citroen's fruit. And, um, <laughs> and um, so I, I actually had to go to school to, to get access to knowledge because there was, so theoretical knowledge was only there. And uh, I, I had to remember, because that was the only way to take it with me. Look at today. I was, I was talking to a teacher and, and a student, and, and then I said to the, to the teachers, you know, you could, um, you could look up on TED Talk. And he said, TED Talk? Yes. And I said to the student, you know what it is? Yes, can you explain your teacher what it is? <laughs> you see, so, so, so the, the, the knowledge in itself is no longer the importance of the school. Because you don't have to go to school to find knowledge. If you if you try to restrict knowledge to what a teacher can give, you know, you have problems. Because a teacher can never, never follow the the uh, uh, the development of knowledge. It's not possible. So so therefore we have to change the role of the teacher to being the person to see to 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 work with children about the knowledge that they can find 
to be critical about that knowledge, to prioritize that knowledge, to see what is what is knowledge, what's good knowledge and not good knowledge. But the knowledge in itself is not important anymore because they can find it better themselves. They can Google it in two minutes. So and, and therefore that's 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 my answer about the students. The students are there. They are living in that world, which means that the school gets more and more irrelevant because they're not linked together. We still take the life out of it, out of it. they don't life in it. People sit there, you know, just because that's the, that's the imagination of schools, so they also learn from the parents, and that is, you have to be fair, you don't talk to mother, they can't do this, they can't do you know. So talk to the children, they know, it's crazy. It's insanity, in many ways. So my question, are they angry about the institution, are they bored? They, they are bored, they, 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 they are bored, they, because it has no relevance for the London. Okay, you have the, the type like Bobo, you know, the, 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 the clever girls who do the things that they uh, want to do. You know, they, they, will, they will survive the system. They get good marks, they're the best, you know, they do all these things, you know. And then they change to leave, you know, and, and they get scared because they know, okay, woo, woo, what's this here, you know. Now, now, you know, so, um, so there, there are, of course, a lot of children who, who feel they are good in the old system. And they, they, of course, they're good in the whole system. The rest, they have no motivation. I just want to add that one of the big problems of our school is that it's not only very boring for, for the bright kids, it's we, we underestimate them. You, you, we are in Reef, uh, a few days ago, we awarded some students, the Makovic and did award, that were secondary school students who did excellent things. And I'm sure their teachers even don't know. Uh, there's one example I always always bring up. Uh, Frankish Joseph, Franz Joseph I, became emperor of the Austrian Hungarian mon Austrian monarchy at the time when he was 18. In 1848, he was 18. And he ruled, and he, he, he really ruled the country. It was not just that he's, you know, parading somewhere. He ruled the country like the prime minister. He was 18. Austrian monarchy had at the time 50 million people, like Germany today. And he was, I'm not saying everybody at that, at that time would, would be able to do that, but he was 18 and he was able to rule a country of 50 million inhabitants. What are doing our 18 year olds in schools? They are sitting there and doing some stupid, boring, artificial exercises with no meaning at all. And, and that, I, I think, one thing that should, one, one thing that should change in our schools is that we should try to bring something meaningful and useful into the schools. I mean, the schools could open up, the, school, the, the students could be much more involved in some real-life projects, they could do something useful, which is not just filling up some, some gaps in a, in a sentence, but to do something which has purpose and, and which can help somebody out there. And we have examples that even 18-year-olds are capable of that, but the schools give them, gives them no opportunity. You mentioned knowledge. Uh, the, the way how we, how we deliver knowledge or how we, how we teach educate knowledge, uh, but we still, we still need to uh, teach kids some, some solid knowledge, some, some hard skills, right? <laughs> <laughs> You know, you have to, we have to understand what is, what is, because if we, if we say, I have to teach you, that's, that's an old phrase from the spectator's role. So, so we have to, we have to rethink this, that knowledge is not a package that you send. But, as, as I also said yesterday, in this conference yesterday, that we have to understand that when you, when you open up for the real life thing here, mm -hmm. you need to, then you need to be a much, much more better and more clearer leadership. So people cannot lead themselves. So children cannot lead themselves through this learning process. It still has to be leadership. But it's a quite, quite different kind of leadership than in the spectator role where there are no leadership. So, so, so I, I, can, I cannot see that the, the teacher is not needed, but not for teaching what you have to know. 
but leading you into that process, helping you with the feedback, to be critical, to work, it's a different process, but it's, it's, it's just as needed as it was in the old system. I think it's time to, to, to be honest and to say that what are we presenting here is not a general consensus what should, what should be do, done in the schools. I know lots of people, and you know them as well, which would be horrified hearing with us and, that, <laughs> and we would say that this is complete bullshit and that, and that this is the end of education and school and everything, civilization. One of them is, uh, is Konrad Liesmann, you may know him, he's an Austrian philosopher who published some three years ago a book about, it was called Theoria des Galanowski, the theory of, I don't know, uneducation. Education. And why, why I'm mentioning him, uh, a few weeks ago he published a second book, it's, it's in, in, the, in Czech, already available, I read it, I, I finished it yesterday, and he's a typical representative of the old school and his book is about everything we are talk, talking about and he says that he is an advocate of, of the knowledge he's saying that what we are losing is is knowledge that the students just can't discuss nothing they have to discuss anything and to be able to discuss anything they must know anything he's very conservative but very, but very influential he's a very well-known intellectual and, and he's not the only one and that's just what I wanted to say that there is a large group of educational experts who say that this is totally wrong and that we have to go back to the basics and we have to put more emphasis on the knowledge and the subjects and mathematics and, and, and all these things and it's interesting that there can be so confronting or contrasting Viewpoints on the same problem. So we all we, we agree that the school is in the crisis, but we say we need to change the paradigm. We need more liberty. We need the, the role of the teacher has to be changed. And the, the, those conservatives say the crisis has been caused by people like us, and that we, that we have distorted the school, and that we have to stop this and come back to the old old fashioned Austrian Hungarian school with the teacher who is an authority and who teaches the subject. So I just wanted to be honest to the public and say that it's just an opinion what we are saying and there are influential people who say who think quite the opposite. <laughs> but I don't agree with Lisman of course but I respect this yeah. point of view. Yeah. Remember that lady because <laughs> it takes my uh, you know I'm, I'm afraid you forget her because uh, Actually, I, I'm not sure it was right she was number four. Uh, uh, so Why are you good. always making me bigger? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, actually, it probably won't be a question. It will be rather a thought, and, and I will be interested in how you how you react on it. Uh, I first want to thank you very much for a large support when when you said that the teachers are are also victims in the system. I'm not a teacher. I'm my name is Kaya and I'm doing training for, mainly trainings for adults. But, but I, from what you said, I really realized that uh, you are speaking about big shift in paradigm of uh, viewing the, the teacher and not seeing it as an as a enemy in the, in the classroom. And when we were speaking actually about the feedback, mm -hmm. I think our main um, context of thinking about the feedback to the teacher is to really show them that they are doing wrong. And I think in this context and in, and in this kind of uh, uh, viewing of the situation, it's impossible to learn anything and change anything because I think it's very natural to be then in position of trying to protect myself of something what, what the others want from us. So, and in, in this line of view, I really somehow have, have much more compassion with the, or with, the, with the teachers who are coming from the, and being within the system, which actually push them to behave as they behave. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I just have a very fresh uh, 
experience with working on one national project of the Ministry of Education, speaking about how the university sh students should be prepared for the prex, for the, for the working uh, environment, being able to discuss with the heads of the universities, mostly technical, which I was totally, what to say, <laughs> uh, I was shocked because the, the view which they presented was absolutely narrow to the really preparing university students to be prepared to work in Volkswagen, in, in specific working spaces, having missing any broader view on either, either direction, or on the personality of the person, of the uh, absolvent of the university, of the broader scope of the view on the on the society, art, other aspects which I consider crucial for human being to be aware of when living somewhere. So I was very much inspired by David Brooks' essay on a big university. Okay. It's exactly opposite direction as our universities are going now, not to more specification and and the, the narrowing down the scope of what the university students should learn, but broader to be exposed to different values, different uh, approaches to the life, to make own choices and be aware of that. To diversity. And to the, well, and, and also way of thinking and way of viewing the world. And, and I think it's really critical to to start at the university level with the with the teachers, but also not to not to be too harsh to the to the teachers because they are victims in a way. Okay. Even though they are influencing the children now, and it's very serious problem to to change that in some way, but also not to be too harsh. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I suppose we may agree upon that teachers is not enemies but friends. <laughs> Part of the system we which are also victims. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, thanks very much for your time and for your insights and for your thoughts. Thanks very much for your time. Well, we're sorry we didn't have time for, for workshop, but I, I think and I believe that uh, you were uh, such inspirational thoughts. Um, but let's be changing in education, let's be friends uh, with students, let's, let's uh, make the relationship sensible and sensible relationship with students and thanks very much for coming. And uh, Lars and Lado are here for, for, uh, for you, so even after the finish of, of this uh, discussion, uh, please use your time and talk to them and also uh, feel free to